from the uh, video yesterday. The primary claim was there is no evidence Jesus was historical. So what are the claims we're trying to deal with? There is no evidence Jesus was historical. Now this claim about there's lots of evidence that shows Jesus was a belief in an angel based on Jewish traditions. We're also going to appeal to the historian for the Jews. We'll find out if there's any sort of Jewish tradition that makes such a claim. Let's talk about evidence. Well, so far, we've made a case for the authenticity of the New Testament documents by evaluating the manuscript evidence as compared to other ancient writings. We have shown that the scholarly evidence reveals a far superior number of manuscripts and a far superior textual purity, meaning from manuscript to manuscript, there's very little variation. And the variations that are there are punctuation, spelling, or capitalization, things like that. <laughs> Nothing that affects the core doctrine. The New Testament collection serves as its own external source of validation given the process by which the eventual collection was arrived at through various multiple sources speaking to various audiences over a period of 70 years, convening on one topic with no variance in the core doctrine. The New Testament is not a book that was produced in one place at one time. It is a collection of accounts that describe the same event with unparalleled volume and accuracy. And we've only brushed the surface of the evidence available within this specific approach, within the internal evidence. Intimate knowledge of Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple in AD 70 sets the Gospels in the appropriate time frame. Jesus' own prophecy of the fall of the temple likewise supports the early first century pre AD 70 setting of the Gospel originals. Additionally, the Gospels are filled with proper names and dates, cultural details, historical events, and customs of the time. It is not feasible that forgers or agents of deceit could have produced the consistent narratives present in the Gospels. Finally, the narrative style and even the particular sophistication of the language used in each Gospel account reflects what is known about the personalities who are attributed to producing them. The study of internal evidence continues on from there, opening a plethora of information supporting the unique nature and authenticity of the New Testament and the life of Jesus. An objective study of the documents using the most reliable and conservative approaches, we're using conservative approaches for interpreting historical events, reveals that the best explanation for the New Testament is that we have a library of documents that is produced or that was produced by first century Jews who were witnesses to the events they described. That is inference to the best explanation for what we have in the New Testament documents. Now for skeptics who will claim falsely that the New Testament cannot be its own source for authentication and will demand to be shown external sources that are non-Christian, we can also oblige that request. When we hold all the evidence up to an objective standard, the New Testament proves to be authentic and the accounts of Jesus do not harmonize with myth. Because of the skeptical objections being responded to at this time, which claim that Jesus is not historical, and that Jesus did not exist and was a myth, and a certain subjective perspective that rejects the New Testament's internal validation, we're going to now look at evidence from outside of the New Testament. Non- Christian sources. In fact, some anti-Christian sources. Let's start with Flavius Josephus, born Yosef ben Matityahu, in around 37 AD, died in around 100 AD, became the greatest Jewish historian of all time. Josephus was uh, taken in by Roman General Vespasian and his son, General Titus. This was after Titus and his forces destroyed Jerusalem and the second Jew uh, Jewish temple in AD 70. Josephus served as historian under the Roman Emperor Domitian. Therefore, given Josephus' Jewish heritage and his later position as a favored Roman, he presents as one who is less likely than any other of that time to espouse or promote the life of Jesus unless it was an undeniable fact of history. To be clear, Josephus was not a Christian and his Jewish heritage and doctrine was one that rejected vehemently the ministry and claims of Jesus Christ and his Roman allegiance doubly establishes him as a definitive source from Jerusalem, from right there in the area, who would certainly rather mitigate Jesus' influence 
most certainly qualifying his work as an external historical account. Uh, one of Josephus' seminal works of historical documentation is known as the Antiquities of the Jews, which he finished in about A.D. 93. Now, let's look in, uh, this, is, this comes from Book 18, Chapter 3, Section 3 of Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus provides the following account at the time of Pilate. There was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, and that he was alive. Once again, that's Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 3, Section 3. That's history. So what we have here is a first century reference to the life of Jesus, his character, his ministry, his death, and the commitment of those who were his disciples, and also their report of his post-mortem appearance. Josephus most certainly uh, had to choose his words very carefully. This is interesting. The conditions that Josephus was writing these histories under is of important note. So he had to watch his words carefully when compiling these historical accounts Accounts, as he was under the watchful eye of Roman Emperor Domitian, who was very much aware of the Christian movement and the threat that such devotion could pose to the stability of his realm. For these reasons, we can anecdotally surmise this to be a downplayed account of, Je of Jesus' life. Not just an account of Jesus' life, probably could have said a lot more, chose not to save his neck. That's anecdotal. That's the only piece that's anecdotal here. But there's more. Josephus also provides attestation to Jesus' family in the mention of his brother James in Book 20, Chapter 9, Section 1 of Antiquities of the Jews, where we read, Ananus, the high priest, assembled the Sanhedrin of the judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Now, we see here two separate accounts of Jesus, and one of them confirming a family member from sources who were certainly not sympathetic to the Christian movement and had no reason to promote such claims except that they are true. In addition to Josephus, there are at least 10 other Christian or secular sources that confirm Jesus as a man living in the first century. Included among these sources are Celsus, Tacitus, and the Jewish Talmud, all of which are decidedly anti-Christian sources, with every reason to ignore or underreport the existence of Jesus. Now, from these sources, we learn some general truths about Jesus and the Christian movement. We can learn 10 essential truths from non-Christian sources. These are that Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar. He lived a virtuous life. He worked wonders. He had a brother named James. He was acclaimed to be the Messiah. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified on the eve of the Jewish Passover. Darkness and an earthquake occurred when he died. Mind you, my friends, these are historical accounts. His disciples believed that he rose from the dead, and his disciples were willing to die for the movement. And a couple extra ones. Christianity spread rapidly, even as far as Rome. And lastly, Jesus' disciples denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God. All of those 12 facts we learn from non-Christian sources, either Jewish or secular historical sources from the time. Some of those sources, as we said, are decidedly anti-Christian. No reason to promote Jesus. Okay, so when one sets aside his subjective biases and takes up an objective study of the resources available, it is found among all accounts, Christian, Jewish, and secular, that Jesus himself is mentioned as much or more than the Roman emperor of that time. Let that sink in. When you consider Christian sources, Jewish sources, and secular, non-Christian sources, when we study the documents that are available to us, what we find out is Jesus was mentioned even more than the Roman emperor from that time. That's a fascinating piece of information information for us. This is interesting because Jesus was not a Roman official. He held no status in their courts. So to assert that Jesus is not historical, or to assert that Jesus is a myth, is certainly a position that is easily refuted 
look, I'm a rookie at this. I'm not well established in apologetics by any stretch, but this is easy. I mean, if you're claiming that Jesus is a myth, you're not even trying. You're just giving an emotional opinion. Once again, to assert that Jesus is not historical or that Jesus is a myth is certainly a position that is easily refuted with even the most cursory or superficial examination of the available historical documentation. As an atheist or skeptic, you might not like the fact that Jesus is most certainly a historical figure who lived, died, and is reported to have risen from the dead, but you have no foundation, scholarly or emotionally, for the assertion that Jesus was a myth. If you intend to be taken seriously, you'll have to provide evidence for your claim that refutes and overwhelms the available evidence to the contrary, and you'll also have to reject what is known throughout modern scholarly circles as commonly understood historical fact.